The Church of Our Fathers by Roland H. Bainton. We are at chapter 21. Twice Born Men. And September 23rd, 2000, I share the video on my channel, the Jafarian Trail playlist. Um, I mentioned it in other videos, but uh, anyways. Man is like a clumsy juggler who cannot keep half a dozen balls in the air at once. Now one falls to the ground and now another. The enlightenment kept in the air. The balls of truth and learning and let the balls fall with zeal and power. And all the searching to know whether the Christian religion is true, men forgot what the Christian religion can do. Still worse, there were many clergymen in the Church of England who did not care whether Christianity is true or what it can do. They were interested only in living comfortably at the church's expense and increasing their incomes by taking the money from several churches at once. On the next page is a cartoon of a vicar spreading himself out with hands and feet on four churches. The actual care of the churches was left to poor curates, while the rich vicars enjoyed fox hunting and trips to Italy, or chatted with the neighboring landlords about pigs and horses. Remember, in the, the New Testament doesn't actually write in approval of consuming a pig. The Peter vision doesn't kind of... Anyways. If the churches were neglected... And little was done for those who came to them. Nothing whatever was done for those who stayed away from the church. The masses of the English poor were too dirty and drunken to be woken by clean, nice folk who drove in their carriages to church. Few thought of bringing religion to the poor of England or cared whether the common people were interested in religion. too dirty to be welcomed by clean, nice folk. It's like, okay, drug use and being dirty, well, the being dirty can be part of poor poverty, but, you know, casting people out just because, you know, there are far worse things than drinking. And let's presume, in terms of people's clothing or something like that, that unless they're wearing wealthy clothing and, you know, I mean... Unless they're in rich clothes and they still can't cover themselves, that's that's a different story. But anyways, several revivals came and, you know, I mean, presume the best of people. That was where I was getting. Several revivals came in the last half of the 18th and the first half of the 19th centuries, roughly 1750 to 1850. We shall notice three. Methodism, led by John Wesley and George Whitefield. Anglo-Catholicism, led by John Henry Newman, and the Salvation Army, led by General William Booth. The Methodist movement was begun by a group of students in Oxford, Univers in Oxford Un University. Excuse the burp. Among them, John Wesley and George Whitefield. They were called Methodist and scorned by their fellow students because they mapped out what to do with every minute of the day. With so much method, so much time should be given to study, so much to prayer, so much to work, with prisoners in the jail, and so on. But even this method in religion, which seems, which seemed too much to scoffers, did not seem enough to John Wesley. He was doing enough, but he did not feel sure enough and warm enough. At a quarter before nine in the evening, May 24th, 1738, the feeling of certainty came to him. He could not doubt it now. He felt as if he were really born again. What happens, he says, when we were born in the first time? We were alive before we were born, but we did not breathe as yet. Even so, although we may be alive in religion, we are not born until we begin to breathe the Spirit of God. The new birth is the change 
wrought in the soul by the Spirit of God. When the love of the world is changed into the love of God, pride into humility, pride into humility, passion into meekness, hatred, envy, malice, into sincere, tender, disinterested love for all mankind. In a word, it is that change whereby the earthly is turned into the mind, which was in Christ Jesus. This is the nature of the new birth. So every one that is born of the Spirit. Now, spiritual rebirth doesn't have to be in a particular specific gendered embodied entity that people worship, um, but certainly that is the belief. And how would we know a mind that says it's in Christ Jesus versus a mind that would be in that? And if Jesus was a body, uh, I mean, if Jesus was physically incarnate, if you're going to say that, then wouldn't that limit the mind? Uh, wouldn't that limit what you're in? Um, but John Wesley wanted other people to have this feeling too. Whitefield had it. They both became ministers of the Church of England and began preaching in the churches about the new birth, but the religious life of the church had grown so cold that the members were blistered by the heat of the preaching and closed the pulpits to the Methodist. What then? If the churches are closed, we will preach out of doors, says Whitefield and Wesley. They went to the people where they were at the mouths of the coal pits as the miners went down or came up from work to the villages of England and Scotland, Ireland and America. The common people heard them gladly, and sometimes the audiences were as many as twenty and thirty thousand. But hoodlums tried to break up the meetings by blowing horns, ringing bells, or hiring the town crier to bawl in front of the preacher. Sometimes cattle were driven into the congregation. Once a mob burst into the house where Wesley was staying. He walked into the thickest of them and called for a chair. My heart was filled with love, he writes, my eyes with tears and my mouth with arguments. They were amazed and were ashamed. They melted down. They devoured every word. What a turn was this? Well, shame and guilt are different things, but wanting people to feel bad, I don't know about that one. Um, Wesley thanked God for getting together such a congregation of drunkards, swearers, and Sabbath breakers. Well, the Sabbath breakers, the ones who work Friday night to sunset on Saturday. That's that's the biblical Sabbath, so your supposed Sabbath isn't your what your own Bible teaches you. Sometimes the bullies got caught in their own traps. Once a man in the crowd lifted his hand to throw a stone, when another thrown from behind caught him right between the fingers. Another came with pockets full of rotten eggs. Wesley writes, a young man coming unawares clapped his hands on each side and mashed them all at once. And sometimes the bullies were themselves overcome by the man they were trying to crush. When a mob was nearly on the point of killing Wesley, and a stout club had just missed his head, he, been, he began quietly to pray. Suddenly, the leader of the mob turned and said, Sir, I will spend my life for you. Follow me, and not one soul here shall touch a hair on your head. They got out, of, they got out safely. And that man became a leader in Methodism. And these, just like certain other churches, this physical styles that they adapted. Um, later got passed on, but there are contemporary uh, Methodist services nowadays. Wesley rode up and down England, Scotland, Wales, and Ireland, preaching in the fields and visiting the jails. He always traveled on horseback. In seven months, he covered 2,400 miles, and during his life, 225,000 miles. Sometimes he made 90 miles in one day. He rode with a loose rein. That was the best way, he said, to keep a horse from stumbling. And as he rode, he read history, poetry, philosophy, and English, and Latin, and in Greek. By and by, the tide turned and people began to admire him. Mayors offered him the freedom of the cities in which he had been mobbed. 
In his 85th year, on visiting a certain town, he wrote, The last time I was here, about 40 years ago, I was taken prisoner by an immense mob, gaping and roaring like lions. But how is the tide turned? High and low, now lined the street, from one end of the town to the other, out of stark love and kindness, gaping and staring as if the king were going by. But this did not please Wesley so much as did the change in the people. Of one town, he wrote, that it had been remarkable for the Sabbath breaking, cursing, swearing, drunkenness, and a general contempt of religion. But it is not so now. And again, so is the roughest town, because became one of the quietest towns in England. I will show him, I will show you him, that was a lion till then, and now is a lamb. Him that was a drunkard is now sober. These are my living arguments for what I say. Oh, but, I mean, even though I've never got myself drunk or intentionally drunk anything with alcohol in it, uh, well, I mean, with an alcoholic ingredient, um, my stomach rumbled a little bit when I said that. Um, these are my living arguments for what I say. That God does now, as of old, forgive my sins and send the Holy Spirit to us and to our children. There is an emotional reaction that happens when people turn. So let's distinguish between that and spiritual experiences sometimes. Wesley knew that to stay this way, men needed more help than mere preaching. For one who had been given to drink, to keep sober was no easy matter, particularly if they don't know the uh, ways to shut off the the withdrawals and the uh, the cravings. Old friends would tease him into taking one pint and then another until they had the fun of seeing a Methodist drunk. That this should not happen. Methodists bound themselves together in classes of twelve members who met once a week to strengthen each other by telling the trials they had met, the struggles and the victories. Each member of the class had a ticket. At the head of of this chapter is shown the ticket of Mary Hart. And you think that's where the whole 12-step thing comes from, perhaps? The movement grew. A building for meetings was secured in London. It had been a cannon factory, the roof of which had been blown off. Wesley replaced the roof and turned it into a church. Men were not ordained ministers of the Church of England, as were Wesley and Whitefield. Men who were not ordained ministers of the Church of England, as were Wesley and Whitefield, began preaching in the, this church. At first, Wesley was inclined to stop them, but when he saw the power with which they preached, he let them go on. The Methodists thus came to have lay preachers. By and by, more ordained ministers were needed, and no bishop of the Church of England would ordain them. Thereupon, Wesley himself set aside one who should ordain others. In this way, the Methodist Church came to have bishops of its own, all these steps, the class meetings, the church building, the lay preachers, and the bishops met, made Methodism into a church that separates from the Church of England. Wesley was sorry. He had wanted to revive the Church of England, not to divide it. He did not, uh, uh, he did revive it in a way which he did not live to see. About a hundred years after Wesley and Whitefield had been students at Oxford, Another group of students met in their rooms at the same university to see what Wesley had done for the English poor. To see how what Wesley had done for the English poor could be done for the bulk of those in the English church. They felt, as Wesley had done, that the, that the Enlightenment had lost some of the great parts of Christianity. Wesley had recovered the warmth and purity. They wanted to recover the faith, also, the faith and beauty. The Enlightenment, they said, had pruned the Christian faith altogether too much and forgotten that God is not so simple. He is great, holy, and tremendous. The old creeds of the church alone set forth the richness of God, and Puritanism, they thought, had destroyed the beauty of religion by removing everything from the services practiced by the Church of Rome. Well, there are different types of beauty, but people get used to certain things. The Oxford students lived to imagine the church in England as it had been in the Middle Ages, when, as the poet 
Sir Walter Scott writes, And show and slow up the dim isle afar, with sable cow and scapular, and snow white soul and snow white stoles, and order due the holy fathers two and two. A long procession came, taper and host, and book they bear, and holy banner flourished fair, with the Redeemer's name, the mass was sung, and prayers were said, and solemn requiem for the dead, and bells tolled out their mighty peal, for the departed soul's wheel, and ever in the office close, the hymns of intercession rose, and far echoing, and far the the echoing aisles prolong the awful burden of the song. Dies ira, dies illa, solvet saculum in favila. Day of judgment, day of ire, when the world dissolves in fire. But if the Church of England should go back to so many of the beliefs and practices of the Church of Rome, why not go back to the Church of Rome itself and not have the Church of England anymore? This was what John Henry Newman came to think. He joined the Roman Catholic Church. Most of the Oxford group, however, did not agree with him to be a Catholic, said they, and to recover the faith and beauty of the Catholic Church, where one does not need to be a Roman Catholic. One can be an English Catholic. They called themselves Anglo-Catholics, which means English Catholics. And illustration there. As the English church had been in need of revival in Wesley's day, so a century later Methodism itself was in need of, of revival. The great-grandchildren of the first poor Methodists had grown too prosperous to care greatly for the poor of their own day. Yet the Methodist Church still had enough of the spirit of Wesley to make more men who were like him. One was William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army. He is supposed to have said, There is one God, and John Wesley is his prophet. Yeah, there's a lot of that uh, trying to mimic the uh, Islamic creed, but if you're Christian, you don't really mean the one God part. So, As Wesley went to England's poor, at the mouths of the coal pits, Booth found them in London slums. As Wesley used boulders for pulpits, Booth used curbstones. The Methodist leaders called Booth to a conference and told him that he must settle in a church and give only half his time to the poor. His wife, Catherine, his wife, Catherine, who was there, called him, Never, William, never! Oh, I should have done a more feminine voice, but I'm a man. Um, together they started a movement after Wesley's own heart. And they did more than preach to the poor. They started soup kitchens, shelters for the men sleeping, and shelters for the men sleeping on the bridges, homes for girls in trouble. Well, by girls, I'm sure they mean young women. And Booth woke up all England by a book called In Darkest England. A book had just came out with the title In Darkest Africa. Booth showed that England was darker still. I definitely agree with that. As Wesley had taken lay preachers, so Booth took those who were one and put them right to work, winning others. Zeal mattered more than book learning. Once, a fisherman was preaching on the story of Jesus in which the servant said to his master, Lord, I feared thee because thou art an austere man. See, spiritual master, curie, and referring to him as a man, that should tell us something. The fisherman thought that it was oyster man and told how the oyster fishermen had to get wet and dirty and cut their hands on the shells to win the oysters. So Jesus suffered to win men. Twelve men were fought. Uh, twelve men were won that night, and when the mistake was pointed out to the fisherman, he said, "Never mind, we got twelve oysters." The name for the new movement was chosen by one of the members. He suggested the Salvation Army. They have good thrift stores. The name took, and then the workers were called sergeants. 
Corporals, captains, and majors, William Booth did not quite like being general, but he had to accept the title given him. The flag had a base of red for the blood of Christ. Well, all the Christs had blood. I have a red flag. That's The red represents the blood of the martyrs. You've seen it in some videos, perhaps. The flag had a border of blue for holiness and a center of yellow for the fire of the Spirit. The Salvation Army had a band, or at least a cornet, drum, and cymbals. They marched and played and sang and shout, Hallelujah! Lucifer and God is one way to render it, but uh, looking towards and Venus and God, looking towards and God, you know. Um, the book, instead of and, could be joined, but anyways. When Booth died, the poet Vachel Lindsay wrote these verses to be sung to the ever softer and slower beating of the drum. Muth died blind, and still by faith he trod, eyes still dazzled by the ways of God. Booth led boldly, and he looked the chief, eagle countenance in sharp relief, Beard a flying air of high command, unbated in that holy land. I'm not sure if I know how any of these songs go, so um, if I don't get the right tone, well, you know, deal with it.